For when Leon and Hegesicles were kings of Sparta, the Lacedaemonians, who had good success in all their other wars, suffered disaster in that alone which they waged against the men of Tegea. Moreover, in the times before this, they had the worst laws of almost all the Hellenes, both in matters which concerned themselves alone and also in that they had no dealings with strangers. And they made their change to a good constitution of laws thus. Lycurgus, a man of the Spartans who was held in high repute, came to the oracle at Delphi, and as he entered the sanctuary of the temple straightway, the Pythian prophetess said as follows, O oh, you have come, O oh Lycurgus, to this rich shrine of my temple, loved you by Zeus and by all who possess the abodes of Olympus, whether to call you a god, I doubt, in my voice is prophetic, God or man, but rather a god, I think, O oh, Lycurgus. Some say, in addition to this, that the Pythian prophetess also set forth to him the order of things, which is now established for the Spartans. But the Lacedaemonians themselves say that Lycurgus, having become guardian of Leobotes, his brother's son, who was also king of the Spartans, brought in these things from Crete. For as soon as he became a guardian, he changed all the prevailing laws, and took measures that they should not transgress his institutions. And after this, Lycurgus established that which appertained to war, namely, enomotes and triacads, and common meals, and in addition to this, the ephors and the senate. Having changed thus, the Spartans had good laws, and to Lycurgus, after he was dead, they erected a temple and they pay him great worship. Oh, hi, hello, and welcome to the very first episode in this year's special series of episodes dedicated to none other than Sparta. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv, she who is preparing to have a new and exciting influx of men who like ancient military and 300 and Thermopylae and oh, welcome. And also, I don't know, good luck, I guess. I hope I'm your cup of tea. But yes, that's right. I am bringing you four weeks of episodes dedicated to one ancient city. But it's not just any ancient city. It's Sparta. I mean, it's Sparta. That passage I read at the top was from Herodotus's Histories. He's introducing us to the mostly mythological lawgiver, yet deeply influential founder of so much of what Sparta became famous for, a man named Lycurgus. But don't worry. We'll get into what all that means. So why did I pick Sparta as my next big research series? Last year we covered Atlantis, and Sparta might seem like a very big departure from that pseudo-archaeological nonsense. But it really isn't. They have one major thing in common, but we'll get there. For now, let's look at what exactly this series is going to entail over the next four weeks' worth of episodes. Just like with last year's Atlantis series, I'm bringing you Tuesday's episodes that are narrative, just me talking to you like I always do. They're going to feature lots of things we normally talk about, like myths and mythological characters and heroes, ancient sources, what survives and from where, the usual. But they're also going to feature history, lots of history, and how that history is inextricably tied not only to traditional mythology of ancient Greece, the stuff we all know so well after so many years of this podcast, but also to Spartan myth-making. And when I say Spartan myth-making, I don't mean people like Helen or Menelaus, Pindarius or Leda or the twins Castor and Polydukes. No, I mean the very conscious myth-making of classical Sparta. Because they really made themselves into what we think of now, both through their actual actions and the propaganda that then accompanied those actions. Think Thermopylae, Leonidas, 
Leonidas. I'm going to try to pronounce it the other way because that's how all my guests say it. And it sounds a little bit less like Gerard Butler. So Leonidas, those 300 Spartans, and so much more. Which leads us to the Spartan Mirage, the main purpose of this series of episodes. But (laughs) we'll get there. On the episodes released on Fridays, as always, I will have guests talking to me about their subjects of expertise. And in the case of the next four weeks, those expertise are all things Spartan. I have experts in Peloponnesian culture and history and mythology, in ancient military culture and practices, in pseudo-history and pseudo-archaeology, and in Sparta broadly. I even have one of the top names in Spartan history who actually, like, came to me to ask to be on the show. What a thrill. That is all to say, I have so much Sparta to bring you all. From myth to culture to history and society, from the ancient world to now, and how Sparta has been appropriated by a certain group of people that ties it back to our Atlantis series. From Helen to the Dioscuri to Thermopylae and long after, including everything that Sparta has come to represent today. The good and the very, very bad. Which again leads to just a hint of what the modern notions of Sparta and Atlantis have in common. Much to the fury of ancient historians and, I can only assume, modern Spartans. Both Sparta and Atlantis have become beloved by the very worst of the alt-right. But we'll get there. First and foremost, let me tell you right now that I don't intend to give you a full and complete history of Sparta. That's both not in my wheelhouse and just not possible over four weeks. What I am going to tell you are the basics, the when and the why and the how, the things you need to know in order to understand Sparta broadly, the Spartan mirage as a concept, and as one of my guests will put it, what makes Sparta so weird? Because, oh, was Sparta weird in the truest sense of the word like did you know that spartan cultural practices and political structure was vastly different than the rest of the greek city-states and that later during the roman empire actually it basically became a spartan themed amusement park (laughs) yeah This is episode 194. Why is Sparta so weird? An introduction. Ancient Sparta and the Spartan Mirage, part one. In the south of the Peloponnesian peninsula of mainland Greece, in the fertile valley of the Eurotas River, there's a place called Laconia. There, so the myths say, the children of Heracles returned to claim their birthright. These children of Heracles, the Heraclidae, returned to many cities in the Peloponnese, like Argos, Mycenae, and Pylos. Heracles was always meant to rule those cities, the stories say, but was supplanted by king after king until his children took it all back with the help of a people to the north, the Dorians. This is the myth the Spartans and others in the Peloponnese used to affirm their identities. They, you see, were descended from Heracles himself and thus destined to rule over their respective kingdoms. It also explains what we now call the Dorian invasion, an unproven and theoretical theory as old as the ancient world itself, that the Dorians came from the north and supplanted the people in the south, accounting for differences in their language and history, among other things. This story will come up in conversations during the Spartan series, but for now, you can just imagine what it means to be descended from Heracles, to have that hero of all heroes determine your rightful rule over a region. And of course, that region in question is in the heart of Laconia, in that fertile valley of the Eurotas River, and we call it Sparta. Sparta, which was also called Lacedaemonia, particularly in Homeric epic, is as old as most of the ancient regions of Greece that we know so well. There was a Mycenaean presence there in the Bronze Age, though it wasn't as prominent as Mycenae or Pylos or Tiryns, but it was there, 
They have been there at least that long. But it's well after the height of Mycenaean Greece that the stories say the Dorians invaded, or rather that the Heraclidae returned to the Peloponnese. This, they say, happened after the so-called Bronze Age collapse and before the early Iron Age period, that period sometimes incorrectly referred to as the Greek Dark Ages. But remember, Dark Ages is a misnomer because it technically refers to a lack of sources and, well, there are sources for this time period. It is not dark. While the Storian invasion and settling of what will become the Sparta we know was mostly mythical, and certainly the Sons of Heracles bit is mythical, this theory does account for a number of references in the historical sources to Dorians coming down and taking over, and it accounts for changes in language after the Bronze Age, among other things. I'm certain I can do an entire series on this alone, the theories around the Bronze Age collapse and the so-called Dorian invasion, but that is for another time. For now, there are two mythological foundings that I want you to have a grasp on. I'll go into detail on the Heraclidae stories in the episodes on mythologies of Sparta, but today you just need to know that that was a thing. The return of the Heraclidae, the children of Heracles, accounts for the Heraclean foundations of Sparta, linking them with the most important hero of Greek culture. And then there was Lycurgus. Lycurgus was a kind of like a founding father of Sparta. He didn't found the actual city, but he was said to have basically made it what it was. He was their lawmaker, just like Solon was in Athens. He instigated new laws and political structures, which we will talk more about, things that would go on to make Sparta so incredibly unique amongst the rest of the Greeks. But, well, he was probably mythical and probably never actually existed, at least in the form that we hear about. Most of what we know about Lycurgus actually comes from Plutarch. You might remember Plutarch from my episodes on Theseus, because, yeah, Plutarch was a Roman author who wrote so-called biographies of important Greek and Roman men, particularly comparing the two. So he wrote about Theseus, and he wrote about Lycurgus, both of whom probably never existed, but were understood to be a kind of cross between mythological and historical people in their time. Or at least by Plutarch's time. But what that also means is we don't know much about this probably mythical Lycurgus other than what a Roman author was, who was writing hundreds of years after the height of Sparta tells us, when there was little more than a place for the Romans to go and cosplay Thermopylae. Which again, we will get into, but basically that's a thing. <laughs> and we will talk more about Lycurgus and those laws and things he was said to have installed in ancient Sparta. From there, we're going to jump to, historically, the 8th century BCE, when Sparta invaded and eventually annexed Messenia to the west. This is when they start to really build out one of the Spartan features that makes them quite different from the other Greek cities. Weird, if you will. So, in an attempt to gain more land, Sparta marched on the region of Messenia. Or honestly, it could have been for other reasons, we're not entirely sure, but it's most likely to do with land gain, and frankly, the point here is simply that they did it. They marched on Messenia. Messenia was conquered by Sparta, and they eventually enslaved the entire population. This is a real simplification of events, don't get me wrong, but the point of this bit is, of their history, at least in today's episodes, is to introduce the concept of helots, this enslaved population of Messenia. Now, all of ancient Greece had enslaved peoples, but for all the Greeks broadly had enslaved populations, Sparta did it differently. They had what they called helots, a special name for a special type of slavery that is not seen in other parts of the Greek world, an enslaved population that outnumbered their own population by a lot. And it only continued to get worse as Sparta continued to helotize other local people. Those Spartans in charge broke apart Messenia into 9,000 cleroi, basically allotments of arable land, that were then each assigned to a Spartan citizen. This number has backing in the Lycurgus myth, but who's to say if it's accurate or not. What it does is give us a, a loose baseline for the number of Spartan citizens at this time. 
9,000-ish citizens, something we will see decline throughout the centuries and eventually will cause them to lose everything they ever gained. This land allotment came with a Helot family, a Mycenaean family that had been forced into enslavement on their own land and who would then work that land for a Spartan. See, because Helots were the ones who actually worked the land and then gave all the fruits of their hard work to the Spartan citizen who was in charge of that land, they essentially facilitated one of the other things that would go on to make Sparta so weird. I mean, the Spartans were essentially just the rich landlords living off of their tenants' rent in antiquity. (laughs) And then, you know, complaining about it. It's something new and different, right? It doesn't sound familiar at all. Oh, you, like me, live in Canada and and think that this sounds actually maybe vaguely familiar? Landlords hoarding all the wealth? Huh, never heard of it. Okay, fine, this joke is going on too long, but I'm, I'm a millennial and I'm living in BC in late-stage capitalism, so I can never leave my current apartment because I'd have to pay thousands of dollars more in rent uh, for something comparable uh, because landlords own everything and no one else can buy anything. <laughs> the world is on fire. Okay, where on God's earth was I? Right. So Sparta conquered Messenia, took all of their land to become supremely wealthy landlords, and enslaved the people into a new population called Helots. But that's not the whole of what made Sparta weird, at least in this specific category of weird. It's that because their enslaved population of Helots did all the actual work for them, Spartans didn't work. And eventually, they couldn't work legally. Like, legally, they weren't allowed to have what we or anyone else back then would consider a job or work in order for them to be an official Spartan citizen. In order for that, you had to be a landowner whose land was run by helots. And thus, you had all the rich man free time in the world. And guess what they did with some of that spare time? They exercised often and were generally just available for the military when the time came. They didn't even really train that much. They were just fit and available, just kind of there, because they didn't have much else taking up their time. And in fact, basically weren't allowed to have anything else taking up their time, but whatever the state wanted from them at any given moment. In order to be a citizen, a Spartiate, you had to devote your time to the state. And sometimes that meant going to war. But mostly it just meant like exercising and hanging out in a room, feasting with other dudes and just like being rich and having that free time. And thus, another thing that made Sparta weird and which we will go into in much more detail in a conversation episode on the Spartan military. But basically, the thing that made them different from the rest of the Greek city-states They just had free time, and when necessary, free time in order to do even just basic military training, planning, strategizing, really simple things. Because these Spartan men had so much free time due to their unique practice of enslavement, they were able to organize and train as a unit, whereas the rest of the Greeks had jobs and lives and worked their own land, at least to an extent. And so their own militaries were just haphazard militias that they put together whenever the time came. There was no training or preparation, they just had to make do when it happened. And that isn't to suggest that the Spartans did a lot of training or focused on their military or really tried that hard to make themselves better than the rest of the Greeks, at least before they got that image, that idea of being better, and then they did it. We'll get into it. But just originally, they had time. Spoilers, that's a brief introduction as to why we think of Spartans as this military-focused people, because eventually they kind of turn themselves into that, or at least make themselves seem like that. Simply because it's reputation that they picked up, they realized it was to their benefit to be considered the best. They weren't originally, and they weren't individually better. Their culture wasn't particularly based in training for battle or war. It was just based in being rich and having free time. 
And the HELOP population and the resulting free time for Spartan citizens is just one of the things that made Sparta weird compared to the other Greek people of the time in the region. But it is a big one. Not least because it's, I mean, it's horrifying. The level of enslavement in Sparta was just inconceivably bigger than that of their fellow Greeks. It was large-scale enslavement and servitude that directly benefited the Spartan people and gave them the lives that then made them so unique. The freedom and wealth and military. That this freedom was achieved through the enslavement of an entire population of people doesn't seem to have influenced much of the rest of the Greeks' opinions on Sparta beyond believing them to be, well, weird. Of course, we don't know for certain how Spartan citizens or really any other everyday Greeks elsewhere felt about the subjugation of the Helots. We do get an interesting note in Plutarch's Life of Lycurgus, which now, remember, Lycurgus was not only probably mostly, if not entirely mythical, but Plutarch was writing about him during the Roman Empire, when Sparta was little more than a shell of itself used to entertain wealthy Romans. I mean, so grain of salt. But from him is where we get basically anything we have. And Plutarch describes practices of the citizens of Sparta when it comes to the treatments of the Helots. One being forcing them to drink unmixed wine, quote, in order to show the young men what it was to be drunk, i.e. like straight up abuse. On top of this, there's also a description of the cryptea, which we will get to more. But the cryptea comes from the word cryptine, meaning to hide. And cryptea literally means like hidden or something hidden. And we tend to refer to this as like a secret service or a police Again, I will go into this more in future episodes, but basically their role was essentially to hunt down helots. Not helots that have run away or done something that they disagreed with, just to hunt down any helots they could find. Just for the sake of it. I hope this troubles you. It should. It it honestly is a ridiculously disturbing part of history that also kind of feels like a little too real in our current world. These practices served to intentionally dehumanize the helots in the eyes of the Spartan people, thus allowing them to be okay with their enslaved population. Or at least to be able to live with how they treated these helots. It's fucking dark! We will try not to focus on it too much, but obviously it's also a super important part of Spartan history and is inextricably tied with literally everything about their culture and their history. Now, like I said, trying to determine how the rest of the Greek people saw this Spartan practice of basically helotizing entire populations of people is tricky. We do know that they saw the Spartans as pretty, well, weird. They recognized a lot of the differences that stood out. Differences that I think will surprise you when we get into them, because it's, it's really not what you think based on a lot of the modern notions of what Sparta was like. And then also, importantly, the ancient Greeks had a thing for freedom, a saying that sounds familiar. But it was just a part of their cultural ethos. Like, to be a free citizen of your polis meant something, no matter which polis you met, you belonged to. And, and again, don't worry, we will get into who was allowed to be an official citizen. And while other Greek people were enslaved all over, there is something about an entire enslavement of a region that was is just particularly disturbing, and likely was hopefully disturbing to the people around Sparta, who would not only have seen the difference from their own practices but also probably fear for themselves should Sparta ever decide to attempt the same thing elsewhere. But the Spartan way of life relied so heavily on the Helots that it was truly a weak point for them, and it would become even more so over time as the official population of Spartans got smaller and smaller and their Helot population got bigger and bigger. In modernity, there's this reputation that the Spartans were just, like, obsessed with war and military, always ready to hop off somewhere to fight. But in reality, it doesn't appear to have been the case. They were incredibly reluctant, actually, to be away from their homeland for long, and usually they they took on the role of mediators between other states over anything else. They avoided the actual fighting as much as possible, instead relying on other Greek polis to do it for them. And that really comes down to helots. Because the Spartans were aware that in order to keep their idea, what they called eunomia, or good order, something else I will get into, but they needed to keep the helots in line. 
So if their entire fighting force that all the men were away from home, they were essentially under threat of losing control of their land. They were already outnumbered by their enslaved people. It wouldn't ever take much for them to stand up to their oppressors. So they didn't want to leave Laconia for long. And they did it as infrequently as possible because their way of life was under constant threat if they weren't there to enforce it. And again, that's why they have something like the Cryptea to enforce this, both the fear in the Helot population and keep them under control and also to dehumanize them in the eyes of the other Spartans so that they could continue to treat them like that. As you can imagine, it was not particularly sustainable. And because of this, Spartan hegemony, when they did have it, didn't last long. But we'll get there. Introduction episodes are hard. The whole Helot situation is very disturbing. I mean, any kind of enslavement is disturbing, but this is just so extra. Still, I promise this series is not all about what made Sparta bad. That isn't the point. The Helots are something you absolutely have to know about, and something that often gets kind of left out or minimized in order to glorify the Spartans. But ultimately, we are going to talk about all of the things that made them different, unique, weird. And particularly, we're going to talk about this pesky Spartan mirage. Obviously, I'm always talking about sourcing and where the information that we have comes from, why. I mean, I'm completely obsessed with how we know what we know about the ancient world and and how we know what we don't know. I could talk about it forever, but I will not. Or I, I will, but just for a little while. When it comes to Sparta, this is particularly important as it poses our greatest problem. The Spartans did not leave us any written sources. Well, I mean, maybe except for Alkman, but he was a lyric poet, meaning he's nowhere near helpful in understanding Sparta as a polis, as a city. And this lack of sourcing causes serious problems, as technically, this means none of our sourcing that we have around Sparta is primary. They're all secondary sources, which means they are influenced and interpreted through the bias of their authors. And then To add another layer, they're being interpreted and understood through scholars and everyday nerds like you and me now. But importantly, their authors, by and large, tended to be Athenian. And how do we think the Athenians felt about Sparta? Spoiler, they didn't love them. What with the constant wars and the time that Sparta beat Athens in the biggest war of the Greek (laughs) city-states. Now, why is this such a problem, aside from the obvious? Well, the problem with getting our information from biased sources is that we are not getting an accurate representation of the topic at hand. We are not seeing the Spartans as they saw themselves, but as those around them saw them. And often, those around them saw them through the lens that Sparta gave them. You might even call it a mirage. Given the amount of squabbling and pettiness that was ever present in the ancient world, you can see how this would be an issue. Plus, Sparta was notoriously secretive when compared to the rest of the ancient Greek world. Rarely were they chill with people coming into their polis or for their citizens to spend considerable amounts of time outside of the polis when not on campaign. So it's not like people had much of an opportunity to get to know the Spartans for who they really were. They just had what the Spartans showed themselves to be or told others that they were. Which leads right into the very important and ever-present Spartan Mirage. You may have heard this phrase before. If I have to admit it to you all, I did not know the phrase before I started speaking with the guests for this episode series, but it quickly became obvious that the thing I knew about the Spartans was, in fact, the Spartan Mirage. I just never heard the phrase. It's been a while since I was in university. Apologies. But you might have heard this phrase before and asked yourself, what in Gaia's green earth 
is the Spartan Mirage. So I'm glad you asked. Thank you. The Spartan Mirage generally refers to what is thought or believed about Sparta, both in antiquity and modernity. And the best part about it is that often this mirage was created and perpetuated by Sparta itself. Like, really intentional propaganda. I don't want to use the word propaganda quite in the sense that we think of it now. I more mean it as the way of just, like, them intentionally putting out a message about themselves. And don't worry, we are going to talk lots more about this. There's a reason that it's in the title of this series. All the beliefs and ideas about Sparta that arise from their incessant ambiguity falls under this this category of the mirage, and it actually poses a serious problem for scholars of Sparta. Like, how are we supposed to know for certain what is something that is actually reflective of who Sparta was as a people, as a culture, versus what is something that arises from other beliefs about them or their intentional subterfuge? Because this is where the problem of sourcing and the problem of the Spartan Mirage collide. The biases of the sources in antiquity feed into the Spartan Mirage because the Spartans were sometimes intentionally feeding those sources that mirage. And then that mirage and issues with sourcing just continue on until today. Because the Spartan Mirage is explicitly not a modern phenomenon. It was very much around in the ancient world as well as today. It's slightly different now, but oh, was it there back then. It's Spartan myth-making. It's the stories they wanted told about themselves by the rest of the Greek world. The triumphs and the successes, the ideas of them as ultimate warriors, the saviors of the whole of the Greek world. Yes, I'm talking Thermopylae, I'm talking Leonidas, and so much more. It's not that these things didn't happen, but they probably wouldn't be as famous or culturally important as they are if the Spartans hadn't campaigned pretty intentionally to make them that way. It's so cool. I will talk so much more about this when we get into the series, and particularly so will my guests. It's a huge part of what I want to share with you over the next four weeks, because it's fascinating and kind of mind-blowing, but it's also it also led to a whole wealth of misunderstandings and misappropriating of the Spartan culture, their people, and even phrases that they might have said. If you know, you know. But in order to understand this whole idea, the mirage itself, we need to think a bit more about the sources that we do have. Who are our sources when it comes to Sparta? As I mentioned at the top of the episode, there is Herodotus, a man that I'm sure many of you are familiar with because, I mean, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, anyone? Herodotus is the so-called father of history. He with the very clear thesis statement. Herodotus focused on the period of the Persian Wars, and, and as you might expect, Sparta played quite a role in the Persian Wars. Not just at Thermopylae, but also as the de facto head of the Greek forces against Persia. We will talk much more about Sparta's role in the Persian and the Peloponnesian War in a bit. I mean, we won't go into specifics now. Who has the time? I sure don't. But I digress. Back to Herodotus. Like I mentioned, it's important to recognize your source's biases. Herodotus was Greek, from Halicarnassus on the coast of Asia Minor, but he was also a, from a Greek region that had been taken over by the Persians within his lifetime. You can hear more about this in the episode that I did on Herodotus in Egypt with Kate Maniti. That one was so much fun. I'm forgetting whether I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, in case I'm sorry, Kate. Uh, but as we learned in that conversation, Herodotus does try to be pretty objective description of hippopotamus aside, he does speak to the accomplishments and achievements of quote-unquote non-Greeks. But that being said, I mean, he's still an ancient Greek man, and boy do they love themselves, thus influencing a lot of what he had to say and how he said it. Thucydides is another source for the Spartans in the 5th century, and in many ways is quite similar to Herodotus. 
Both are writing histories about these big wars that swept through the Greek world in the 5th century, though both of them had very different vibes, I guess. <laughs> Herodotus is writing about the Persians attacking Greece and being mostly kind of ultimately held off by the Greeks, whereas Thucydides is writing about a war between Greek city-states. So yeah, like deeply different vibes. While Herodotus reminds me more of a wholesome grandpa who tells you stories of the olden days while gardening, Thucydides is, is more like the uppity strict grandpa who's telling you about his days in the war and is generally unimpressed when you often drift off. Xenophon, too. There's Xenophon. He's another source that we have, but I will speak more on him soon. Ultimately, though, remember that all of these men are not Spartan. They're mostly Athenian, other than Herodotus, and so they're going to bring in their beliefs and their worldview. They're going to bring that with them when they discuss the way Sparta handled things. Ugh, it's fascinating. We're also going to talk a lot about Pausanias and some Plutarch, but they are worlds of their own. Pausanias is writing during the Roman period, and but he, was inter he is Greek, but he was interested in, in talking to people, looking at things, and writing them down. We love him for that. We will talk a lot about it in the conversation on Friday. But because of that, like, history wasn't really his thing, or at least, like, history of the classical period. Not that he wasn't into it, but he just doesn't talk about it a ton. But that period, the classical period, is primarily what we're concerned with when it comes to the Spartan mirage. And Plutarch, well, again, he's a Roman writing during the Roman Empire, and he's just concerned with comparing ancient Greek political figures, mythological or otherwise, with Roman political figures who were very real. Other than Romulus. I'm going too far into the realm. So while helpful in some ways, Plutarch is not an ideal source for much at all. You're going to feel like I'm beating you over the head a bit with these sources, uh, this thing through the series. Uh, but it's it's part of looking at the ancient world and, and really any history. I know it can be repetitive and you'll be screaming back at me like, I know, Liv, you say it all the time. But it's it's good to remind yourselves so constantly. And people don't always listen to all the episodes, which means I have to say it all the time. Here we are. I know I'm saying this as if I don't do it in most episodes these days, because again, I'm obsessed with ancient sources. But this is especially important here and interesting when it comes to Sparta because of just how influential the Spartan mirage became and has been and still is on perceptions of Sparta throughout history. While he isn't a particularly helpful source for the historical issues when it comes to Sparta, though, Pausanias, like I mentioned, he had a unique way of preparing his travel writing. He went around the Greek world and he just asked questions of the locals, whoever they might have been. What this means is that he got a true sense of what everyday people believed about their land and their history and their mythology. He did this a few hundred years after the height of Sparta's power and rule, well, when they were just a shadow of what they once were. But the stories of the people of Sparta and Laconia broadly are still told in great detail in Pausanias' work. They're just invaluable. So let's start to wrap up this introductory episode on Sparta with Pausanias' own telling of their early kings and what myths they, at least at the time of Pausanias, believed about their origins, including not only where the name Lacedaemon and Sparta come from, but even a brief mention of the return of the Heraclidae, the most famous mythical kings of Sparta, and an explanation of one of Sparta's other big oddities. They had two kings. Now, the section is a bit abridged, and you can find more in the episode's description, but Pausanias tells us, quote, According to the tradition of the Lacedaemonians themselves, Lalex, a native, was the first king in this land, after whom his subjects were called Lalegis. Lalex had a son, Melis, and a younger one, Polycaon. On the death of Melis, his son Eurotas succeeded to the throne. He led down to the sea by means of a trench the stagnant water on the plain, and when it had flowed away as what was left formed a river stream, he named it Eurotas. Having no male issue, he left the kingdom to Lacedaemon, whose mother was Tayete, after whom the mountain was named. While according to report, his father was none other than Zeus, Lacedaemon was wedded to Sparta, a daughter of Eurotas. 
When he came to the throne, he first changed the name of the land and its inhabitants, calling them after himself. And next, he founded and named after his wife a city, which even down to our own day has been called Sparta. Amaclas, too, son of Lacedaemon, wished to leave some memorial behind him and built a town in Laconia. Hyacinthus, the youngest and most beautiful of his sons, died before his father, and his tomb is in Amaclae, below the image of Apollo. On the death of Amaclas, the empire came to Agalus, the eldest of his sons, and afterwards, when Agalus died, to Kinortas. Kynortes had a son, Obalus. He took a wife from Argos, Gorgophony, the daughter of Perseus, and begat a son, Tyndarius, with whom Hippocoon disputed about the kingship, claiming the throne on the ground of being the eldest. With the end of Icarius and his partisans, he had surpassed Tyndarius in power and forced him to retire in fear. The Lacedaemonians say he went to Palana, but a Mycenaean legend about him is that he fled to Apharius in Mycenae. Apharius being the son of Pyrires and the brother of Tyndarius on his mother's side. The story goes on to say that he settled in Thalami in Mycenae and that his children were born to him when he was living there. Subsequently, Tyndarius was brought back by Heracles and recovered his throne. His sons, too, became kings, as did Menelaus, the son of Atreus and son-in-law of Tyndarius, and Orestes, the husband of Hermione, the daughter of Menelaus. On the return of the Heraclidae in the reign of Tisimenus, son of Orestes, both districts, Messene and Argos, had kings put over them. Argos had Temenus and Messene Chrysphontes. In Lacedaemon, as the sons of Aristodamus were twins, there arose two royal houses, for they say that the Pythian priestess approved. Oh, well, 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 nerds. We will go into a lot of what was briefly mentioned in that mythological passage, do not worry. I realize it was a lot. I just really wanted to read it all. But thank you all. That was the first episode in this special series examining the mysterious ancient Greek city-state, Sparta, and that pesky, pesky Spartan mirage. Next week, we're going to talk more about what makes them weird as a culture, more about the trouble of sources and beyond. We're going to break down all the little things I introduced today. And on Friday, you will hear my episode with the brilliant Dr. Maria Pretzler, who is the reason this episode calls Sparta weird and who you will hear say the same many, many times, because simply it's true. They were very deeply weird. Dr. Pretzler specifically studies our new friend Pausanias, too, and is the reason for the fascination that I've developed over the past few months since she and I recorded this episode in the summer. We talk about Pausanias as a source, ancient Sparta, and the Peloponnese, and so much more. You're going to love it. I'm so excited about this series. Truly so thrilled. I'm really interested in diving into some historical topics now and then, and particularly when I get to link them so beautifully to myth. Sparta has so much myth to examine, and just like any other ancient Greek city, their myths heavily influence their culture. It's just that their myths and their culture were not particularly militaristic. Meanwhile, everything we think about them is, it's all about that military. And that's a huge part of why I'm doing this series, because it's absolutely fascinating to learn what Sparta actually cared about, actually prioritized, what they were actually like, as far as we know, and then the why and how we ended up thinking about them as this explicitly militaristic society, let alone a group of people who were the so-called best of the best, like, fuck. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's for episodes to come. Before I leave you, though, I also want to let you know that after the end of this Sparta series, I will be doing a Q&A episode so that you can all ask any questions that you might have as the series goes on. I found that super helpful in the Atlanta series, so this time I'm preparing in advance. You can submit your questions about Sparta or this series at mythsbaby.com slash questions, and I will try to get to as many as possible once this series has wrapped. 
But gods, today's episode is long enough. So to finish things off, as always, I'm here to read you a five-star review of one of you that one of you lovely listeners left me. These mean so much to me, and I couldn't be more thankful for all of you. So consider leaving me one, would you? Maybe I'll read it on the show. This one is from a user named Kara with the face from the US. Kara, I'm glad you have a face. Amazing podcast. I found this podcast this year after taking an intro to classical mythology course in my undergrad. This podcast was able not just to help me think about these stories while taking the class, but develop a new interest and love of the ancient world. Live storytelling, humor, and conversations have kept me captivated, and I'm on track to finally catch up to new episodes by the end of the year. I have such a deep running interest now in mythology and have fully embraced it in this year, and I don't think I would have would have without Liv and this podcast. <laughs> Thank you. That's so nice. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things. For this series, Michaela gets an extra special shout-out because while she always helps me with like anything I ever need, she also prepared an absolutely incredible amount of research for this series. I am talking everything I could ever want, including helping me on these scripts. What a lifesaver. Michaela is the official researcher for this series. She is a queen. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron where you'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. You are all the best. I can't wait for you to hear more about Sparta. What a place. Whew. I am Liv and I love this shit. (laughs) 